Welcome to the third Thursday's conversation for January, the 1st of 2023. Today, we are welcoming three guests to talk about the Global Anabaptist Collaborative, David Bushert, Hanak McConan, and Joe Sawatsky. Welcome to each of you who've joined us here. If you'd like to use the chat feature to introduce yourself to the others who are here, make sure you um, write that to all, not just to the panelists, so that everyone can see who's joining us today. And if you have questions at any point during the webinar, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to uh, type those questions in, and then I'll be watching for those and add those to the questions that I asked earlier. So we are so glad to have the three of you come today to talk about what AMBS is doing to train leaders around the world. I'd like you to start by introducing yourselves. Um, normally I have an introduction, but instead we're gonna just have you say a bit about yourself and your role with AMBS's uh, Global Leadership Initiatives. David, would you start please? Sure, I'm <clears throat> David Bushart, president at AMBS. And um, I, uh, I am uh, overseeing the Global Leadership Collaborative. Uh, I inherited uh, some of that role from my predecessor, Sarah Winger Shank. And so I give uh, overall oversight to the strategy for this program and then work very closely in collaboration with uh, our Dean Beverly Lapp and with Joe and Hanuk. It's, a, it's definitely a team effort and uh, a lot of collaboration goes on on campus uh, across departments for this program. Uh, hello, this is Hanok Mokonen. Um, I graduated from MBS and then that's how I started working at MBS. My role here is Global Leadership Collaborative Specialist. Uh, basically, I work with the student until they graduate. As soon as they enter the cohort program and until they graduate, I'll be with them and answering all kinds of questions they ha might have and also assisting uh, if, if the professor is teaching a cohort from AMBS, I will be a teaching assistant for um, for that uh, professor, and also be working with the student as they go through that course. And hello, my name is Joe Sawatsky, and I am the project manager for the Global Leadership Collaborative. I'm also a Mennonite Mission Network employee. And part of my time is seconded to AMBS to help with global Anabaptist education initiatives. Uh, I'm also a 2005 MDiv graduate of AMBS, which prepared me to go to South Africa for eight years with Mennonite Mission Network, working in theological education there, and out of which grew my own um, doctoral thesis as well. So. I owe a lot of my working life to AMBS and Mennonite Mission. And so pleased to be a part of this team. Thanks to each of you. Um, let's start with the question, how did our program in Ethiopia begin? Uh, this was kind of the beginning of this big initiative. Right, so I, I need to back up just a little bit before the Ethiopian program uh, to an innovative degree program that uh, Beverly Lapp designed uh, about 2016-17, uh, somewhere in there. Um, that's a little bit later than that. Anyway, it was a it was an intention to reach students that uh, would not be moving or relocating to campus. The trend is for more students to be studying at a distance. And uh, so we designed the Master of Arts in Theology, Global Anabaptism, as a, a distance only program. It is AMBS's only distance graduate program. And that program very naturally uh, became then available to people studying in all, all around the world. Um, AMBS regularly fields invitations from international church leaders to consider doing educational programs in other parts of the world. We have alumni around the world who are wanting to stay connected to AMBS. And during the end of uh, about the last six months of Sarah Winger Shank's time at AMBS, uh, she began to explore formal partnerships with institutions uh, that we have had historic connections with, the Meserede Christus Seminary, and the Nehemiah Institute in, in Korea. 
so we began MACA with the Masoretti Christus Seminary in the fall of 2019. Uh, we maybe were offering the MACA program and, and wondering if people might just enroll in our MACA program, but the seminary in uh, Ethiopia is very interested in developing their own graduate programs. And so it was determined that we would do cohorts of students, about 10 a year, um, and we would do online classes during the year and then in-person, uh, three in-person intensive classes on campus in Ethiopia each, each summer. Because of COVID, we were not able to do those in-person classes until this last summer, but we did three of them last summer and it was an, it was an amazing uh, experience for faculty and students both. We, we all learned so much and were changed by that experience. During our first year of the program in Ethiopia, um, Hannah McConan was a student here at AMBS, and we immediately ran into some issues around technology and expectations and, and all the kinds of things you run into when you're, you're working cross-culturally, interculturally, and, and Hannah jumped in <laughs> and saved the day <laughs> in, in all kinds of ways. And, and so before long, it was Hennick's student employment at AMBS to provide instructional support for this program. And then toward the end of his time here at AMBS, we received a letter, as did Mission Network, uh, from the national leaders of the Meserede Christos Church saying, we want Hennick to stay in the States. We want him to stay at AMBS and partner with Mennonite Mission Network to, to continue to support this program. So uh, with the help of Mennonite Mission Network, who are, who are paying half of Hennick's salary, and we're paying the other half. It's a wonderful collaboration between our organizations. Hennick is now a permanent part of our staff helping us with this programming. And along the way, as we were developing uh, the Global Leadership Collaborative, um, I engaged Mennonite Mission Network, and uh, we were asking if we could um, partner with them to um, invite Joe Sawatsky to be a program manager or project manager for all of the negotiations we have all around the world uh, to help us uh, talk with potential partners and develop MOUs where we want to do educational development. The other important uh, collaboration that emerged in this process was an invitation from Mennonite World Conference to enter into a formal MOU with them as an uh, identified collaborator. Uh, Mennonite World Conference identified that on every continent around the world in a research study they did, the most urgent need that was expressed in every region of the conference was the strengthening of an Anabaptist identity for leaders and congregations. And so Mennonite World Conference asked us if we would be a collaborator with them in, in doing that work. And the benefit for us is that when we are uh, entertaining invitations from potential partners, we're in conversation with Mennonite World Conference to ensure that we are in conversation with the right people, uh, the right national leaders, and so that we're making sure the church is involved in that conversation, not just institutions, and that we're not undermining uh, the national church structures. So it's been a wonderful collaboration for us. Uh, it, it keeps us out of trouble, <laughs> helps us doing the right things. And uh, we're really grateful for that connection to Mennonite World Conference. We are hoping to graduate our first students from the Matka Ethiopia uh, program this spring or summer. Uh, we had to slow down the process a little bit because of COVID and that was very frustrating, but uh, we will be seeing our first graduations coming this year and it's very exciting. Hanak, what would you like to add to the description of what's happening in Ethiopia? Just how does this work? And what are some of the things that you are working with there? Um, just tell us more about that program. So the way it works is it's, you know, it's by, it's two institutions are involved in this, AMBS and MK Seminary, Masada Crystal Seminary. So the, they will send us a list of names, you know, uh, so they, they do their own registration process. They will advertise, you know, do all kinds of stuff. And they, there are things we require for a student to have before they join the program. So they will do the, you know, the student will show up at MK Seminary and they do interview and check all that um, aspect that we ask them to do. Then as then the, our coordinator from MK Seminary, uh, his name is Yimanu, uh, he will send us a list of names, potential to be in one cohort. So the, our admission process, admission office will accept the names and that's where I will involve in and I will have like one-to-one -one Zoom 
uh, call with each student just to check if they have, you know, those kind of things that we require just so that they can sustain, you know, this is three years program and we run one course per semester and they all put, I mean, put together in one course and every summer, as David Porter uh, described, we will send our uh, MBS box to MK Seminary, where all students will come also there and be with together for intensive program for about like two or two three months. Um, so it's 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 like you need to make sure um, who are joining the Marca cohort, you know, because there is a long process in it and. There's a frustration. So we require certain stuff um, before we join them um, so that they consider us a student. So once they join and they took, they start taking courses, then I would be there with them. You know, the other thing we need to realize is it's, um, you know, in Ethiopia, internet is not reliable. It's on and off and um, power and electricity is not stable. So, it, it just you have to find a way to work around it and and that also requires some kind of resilience um and a student need to have that you know you know muscle to wrestle with us um but beside i mean more than that i mean like i one of the talk, the challenge that i was um when i heard about this initiative when i've been invited and talked about this is like, oh yeah, I know Ethiopia is, you know, in Ethiopia, there's all kind of, you know, this internet and electricity, you know, our students are living around, you know, different part of Ethiopia, they're not in one place. So we rely on each student having their own computer, you know, having that, some of them, you know, might not have like a um, new computer and it's, you know, there's all kind of frustration that goes with that. So, but, you know, as you go through it and work with the student individually, that's one of bunch of my time is working with student individually and make sure that the internet, like their computer is working and they are, you know, doing what they are supposed to do within that week. Um, and every two weeks, we ask them to join us by Zoom so that that will be a time for, you know, the instructor to, you know, open up for a question if there is any question that, within the student and the, the thing that we have done the past two weeks. And um, as you go through that, you know, you will, you will have a lot of questions and problems and that will help you to clarify and you know, like that, uh, resolve that. And that, that's how it moves um, the program. But the cohort program, having them together helps not only the help that we give from here at MBS, but also among them, that it creates a sense of community. So, you know, sometimes they reach out to me if for whatever reason I'm busy, they call to each other and somehow whatever question they have, they will be solved there. So it's, it's really, um, uh, it's a brilliant idea to have this cohort program uh, so that it creates, you know, this, this is gonna be like a group of people being together for three years until they graduate. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I'm going to add on with, to what David Bosher just explained. Thanks, Hanak. And sorry, Dave and Joe, do you want to add anything to that and, and maybe, um, maybe say a bit about how this is funded um, and, and how, what, what you've seen working there? Okay, um, I would say that um, this partnership is really important uh, because it provides us an opportunity to accompany the seminary in Ethiopia as they are developing their capacity for their own graduate programs. So NKS is actually rolling out their first master's programs this fall, and we're celebrating that because uh, we feel like we were a part of helping them, uh, providing support for them to, to start doing this. Uh, um, students for our program are chosen, I think, and we have a different kind of student in mind for our program than the graduate programs that are happening on campus. I think more of the graduate programs that are happening on campus will be for persons who are coming out of the undergraduate program and ready to move into a graduate program. 
my observation is that most of our students in the cohorts for the Masters of Arts in Theology Global Anabaptism are more seasoned leaders. Um, when I was teaching there this summer, I realized, you know, these are most of the people in the class, not all of them, but most of them in the class are, are 10, 15, 20 year veterans in leadership. And I think one of the important things our, our program is providing is, is in a church that is growing way faster than the national church can manage in terms of leadership development. Uh, we're working with a lot of seasoned leaders who I think are well positioned or are already positioned to be regional leaders who can be strengthening that Anabaptist identity of other pastors that they're working with in the local congregations in their region. So that we're trying to, to, to strengthen that Anabaptist theology and identity for leaders who are really well positioned to, to help with the work of, of uh, strengthening that identity in, in the local congregation. Um, how do we pay for all this? <laughs> That's an important question. Uh, as, as we negotiated the arrangement, um, we realized a couple of things. One, um, it's very difficult for students to afford tuition. Uh, and and they, most of them can afford to pay very little in the way of tuition. And secondly, it is very difficult to transfer American dollars from Ethiopia to the US. So in our agreement, students pay a very small tuition and we're leaving that money with Meserede Christus Seminary, again, as a part of helping uh, Meserede Christus Seminary um, to build their capacity for their undergraduate programs. So our costs are all contribute, uh, contribution based. We are, we are reliant on contributions in our constituency and the church to help us uh, carry off this program. And we're finding there's tremendous support for, our, for doing this work. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I would also say that, um, um, just lost that thought. Maybe while you're Maybe thinking- Maybe go on I to could, the next question, thanks. I, I could add that Hanok talked a lot about how he works with students. He also works with professors very well to help us. I've helped teach him the program too and help me know what to do. <laughs> Gives a, he developed a tip sheet of best practices and um, provides counsel to us and also motivates students, I think, and follows up with them and helps interpret us professors to students. So, Yeah, I really want to re reaffirm what you're saying, Joe. We wouldn't want to be doing these classes without Hannah, who also helps us think pedagogically about the context helps us think about source material that we're bringing to the to the context that is uh, to these classes that is contextually uh, appropriate. Um, we, we talk all the time here at AMBS about how we decolonize the classroom. And you know, Ethiopia is a country that has never been colonized. So we don't wanna start colonizing in the classroom. We are trying to be very careful in thinking pedagogically about what is the most contextually appropriate methods for teaching uh, and source material that we're bringing to the to these classes. I think another thing that's really important in this program is the opportunity AMBS has to um, experience the church where it is growing in, in ways that again outstrips the the country's capacity to train leaders. Where we are sitting in a context where the church is is in some ways disintegrating or declining. And so it gives us a wonderful opportunity to ask questions about the nature of Anabaptist leadership in these two very different experiences of the church and to say, what is effective Anabaptist leadership look like? And using the global context as a way to think about that. We're learning every bit as much as our students are learning in these cohorts. And I think we'll come back to that very question again after we hear about all the other initiatives. Any more thoughts on Ethiopia from any of you? All right. Well, we can add them later if you think of something else we should include. Um, last year, there was an educational event for church leaders in Indonesia. What can you tell us about how um, that came together and what happened in that event. Sure. One of our agency partners in Indonesia came to AMBS um, wanting to make connections on behalf of Indonesian institutions and Indonesian Mennonite synods. 
about partnering with North American Anabaptist educational institutions to, yeah, make Anabaptist uh, education more accessible to Indonesian uh, leaders. And also leading up to Mennonite World Conference Assembly, which was just in Indonesia, we brainstormed having a educational event for pastors from all of the Indonesian synods in conjunction with the assembly. But given that the assembly was a bit up in the air due to COVID, we decided to launch out with a webinar that we um, held about a year ago at this time in January of 2022. And we worked with Andios Santoso, who is a recent AMBS grad and Indonesian church leader, and now is also the Asia director uh, for Mennonite Mission Network. And Andios and I and Jewel Ginrich Longnecker and Dave and Bev and others sort of brainstormed this webinar. Um, it was a three day webinar, two hours each day. 7 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S., 7 p.m. Indonesian time, and two hours each day. We organized it kind of along the lines of AMBS's departmental structure. We had an introduction to peace study through a biblical focus, introduction to peace studies through an Anabaptist history and theological focus, and then the third day, we chose a, a practical ministry dimension or a, from something from the broadly church and ministry kind of department. And that was um, on Christian Muslim relations, which of course is something that Indonesians, it's part of their daily reality. But we, um, so we had each day we had an AMBS faculty paired with an Indonesian uh, church leader or scholar to provide input on those topics. And then we had time for questions from the participants in the second hour. And there were 75 to 100 participants each day uh, from all of the Anabaptist Mennonite synods. There are three in Indonesia. And Andios was our moderator for that, or our MC for that event, which was partner a partnership between AMBS, um, the Indonesian synods, and Mennonite Mission Network. So. I think this was a really unusual event, Joe, in that that it was a, an occasion for all three synods in Indonesia to come together. It was a sort of a rare experience, so we were really excited to see that happening. It was also the first time we were working, I think, on, on an educational program with simultaneous translation, where if you were an English speaker, you were hearing only English as the Indonesian was speaking, and if you were Indonesian, you were hearing only Indonesian as the English speaker was speaking, and it was happening just simultaneous. And it, that's hard. <laughs> that is really hard work, but it was it was really helpful in in making an efficient uh, lecture time. It was. And hats I off we, then, Hats off also to Chialis, who right. uh, is married to Andios and is a current uh, MA student at AMBS, who was translation translating for us in that event. So, uh, a lot of the energy about what we're doing, I think, is fueled by alumni and current students who want to take what they're learning at AMBS to benefit the leaders in their own countries as well. So. Thank you. And this fall, there was a pilot program in South Korea. Um, wondering what you'd like to tell us about that. So before Sarah Winger Shank retired, um, Hugh and her, uh, some of you would know his wife, Sue Parker, who, is, who works for Mennonite Church USA Executive Board. Hugh and her and Sue have a, um, a nonprofit organization called Reconciliation in Southern California. And Hugh and happens to be on our board. And so he introduced Sarah, uh, took Sarah and Gerald on a trip to South Korea to introduce them to not only the Mennonite Church of South Korea, but the Nehemiah Institute, which is a non-accredited seminary that has a number of faculty who are um, Anabaptist minded or who are, are Anabaptist adjacent maybe. Many of them trained in the West who are exposed to Mennonite scholars. Um, and Mennon uh, the Mennonite Church of South Korea also 
uh, influenced strongly by the writings of Alan Kreider. And uh, so there's a great affinity growing there and an alternative to sort of the dominant Christian uh, perspectives there. Uh, younger people who want a peace witness in their country who dream of a day for the reunification of North and South Korea. So Sarah and Gerald uh, went there shortly before she retired. And there really wasn't time to explore further um, what could happen there. COVID happened. And so it wasn't until last April that we were able to make another trip and with new, new uh, people involved like me uh, and Joe um, and James Crabo, we uh, made a trip to, to visit and really explore this possibility. Um, I often say about the Global Leadership Collaborative, I, I, when I'm talking to faculty or trying to get their heads around how to teach in these contexts, I said, what we're doing is really hard. We just wanna recognize that this is really hard. And one of our professors, Jamie Pitts, uh, when I said that to him one time said, yes, it's hard and it's terrifying and it's really fun. <laughs> And, and I said, then back to my set, and you know what? It's all three of those all the time. <laughs> it, you just feel it. You feel like you're dancing on, a, on the edge of a, on a tightrope and, and you're wondering when you're gonna fall off it. And, and, and yet engagement with these students and faculty is just so rewarding, so energizing and so much fun. Well, you can imagine doing Matka in, in Korea is gonna be even harder, harder in different ways than it is in Ethiopia because uh, we are gonna to have to do translation. We're fortunate that we can offer the Matka program in Ethiopia in English, but in Korea, we, we have to do um, everything by way of translation. So this fall, we said, let, let's just do a pilot course. Uh, we offered it to students for free. Uh, James Crable taught the course. He started out online. He went for an intensive week in person and then finished online. And it was a very powerful experience. Uh, students, um, after the intensive class, the students started meeting every Tuesday night as a study group. So that they, the community among those students really started to emerge. The administrator of the school was attending the classes for the intensive week. And on the last day of the intensive week, James had students share, uh, sort of reflect on what they were, their biggest takeaways were for the week. And two of the students in their presentations just broke down and wept because uh, the class was um, uh, the sh God's Shalom and the church's witness. So a lot of focus on reconciliation. And two of these students were just moved uh, by a new vision for how reconciliation could happen in context they were relating to it might end family and school, uh, professional educational role that the person was having. The administrator of the school that day on the last day of the class actually asked if he could enroll in the class for credit because he said, I have never seen students in this institution express emotion over, over what they were learning. And he said, I need to understand what's going on here. So the administrative school actually in, enrolled in the class. Well, when you have that kind of outcome, it's pretty hard to say, oh no, we're not gonna do this program. So we are now offering the second course this semester. Uh, again, it's, uh, the students are still guest students, uh, but it is being taught by one of the faculty at the Nehemiah Institute. Um, who has, uh, has spent a lot of time in Anabaptist theology and church history. And so he's teaching a course this semester and we're hoping that in April, May, we'll start our LEAP program, which is our orientation class and, and launch the full master's program there. Hard, terrifying, and really fun. <laughs> Anyone else wanna to speak to the Korean initiative? Sure, and, and the professor that Dave spoke about who's teaching right now, his name is Dakman Bay, and he is teaching history of Christianity in Asia uh, for students enrolled in the Korea Matka program. And that's the design of the program is that some courses will be taught by AMBS professors and others will be taught by Nehemiah faculty who are um, accredited by AMBS to teach in our curriculum. So he's... Uh, teaching that course right now. And also we're hoping to bring him to campus in Elkhart in April so that he can maybe do some preaching and teaching here while he's in the States. I just want to say a little bit about that hard, you know, terrifying and also fun part. It's it's really nice. It's a good mindset up that 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 kind of 
because each professor here at AMBS, they know the subject matter. They know what they're talking about. But still, even though you know everything within that subject matter, knowing that, well, how you need to deliver that in that context, in, their, in the Ethiopia context, in South Korea, in Indonesia, that sensitivity is really, really, really good. And that, that's one of, I think, one of the things that makes me like proud working at AMBS is that, you know, you, they know about this subject matter, you know, you know, they have read all kinds of stuff they need to be read and they figure everything out. It's just that not enough and how this will work there, it still terrifies them and terrifies people here at AMBS, which is good. I, I like that. And, and this is what makes you to partner with the local people there to work with them and you know, to acknowledge the, the knowledge there and how, okay, I have this, you have that wisdom, how you and me can collaborate and do this together, rather than I have all this I need to tell you and I would just dump on you without even that sensitivity. So I, I, it in a way makes me happy to hear this hard, terrifying, and also fun part. Um, it, it kind of shows your, your position, your mindset, and even though you know what you're talking about, it still it still bugs you, you know, makes you uncomfortable how you can deliver it in that context. Thank you for saying that, Hanuk. I, if I could just add a short story really quickly here. Um, I, I think that teaching in this program is bringing a new level of humility to our faculty, not that they're not humble, but um, it, brings, it brings you, as you approach these classes, you, it increases your humility. And if it doesn't, teaching in these experiences will humble you. <laughs> and so better to approach it from humility <laughs> and being humble than uh, letting it humble uh, or humiliate you, maybe even. <laughs> um, but one of the, I had the wonderful experience of teaching uh, leadership for the 21st century this summer to a group of 26 students, and it was an amazing time together. I came in, I think, appropriately humble and was like being very cautious about what I was sharing. And I was always qualifying what I was saying and I, you know, I, I don't know the context here. And I don't, you know, a lot of, some of these thoughts about leadership are Western in my side. And on the, on about the third morning, uh, one of the elder statesman students in the classroom, Freyo came to me and he said, he said, David, we, we are really enjoying this class. We really appreciate what you're bringing. Uh, and we sense you, you are very sensitive to our context and we, we really appreciate that. So all these platitudes, right? Then he says, but, but the way you're talking and always, it gives us the feeling that you're holding back. And so we're wondering, could you trust us to sort out what's relevant here and what isn't and just go ahead and teach. <laughs> and, and that was such a gift for the student to come and, and engage me that way. And so I just let it go. And, and the engagement in the class went immediately to a whole nother level. And students were free to say, you know, yep, love that idea. I haven't thought of that before. Oh, that idea won't work here and here's why. And then I was learning in the, in the position of learning about um, what works here and what doesn't. And it just became a whole new dynamic. So part of it is like, I, we daren't decide on our side what's appropriate to bring to this classroom. And we need a really dynamic partnership with students to uh, to get to that place where we can sort of be free and and trust that our students will be ready to but willing to challenge or to push back or to say yes and um, and and that's been a really a significant learning for me uh, part of the journey of getting through the hard terrifying and fun and when you get to fun it's really fun <laughs> This is just so fascinating. And, and we have some more questions to ask about overall. Um, but before we do that, um, I'm wondering if someone can just name some of the other things that are happening and being explored outside of the, two, the three uh, countries we've identified so far. And I know Dave Miller is one of the participants in the webinar today, and, and he could probably share many, many stories as well. But if someone would just kind of outline the other places where we're doing some work in this collaborative. So yeah, so part of my role is to make connections for degree program as well as for non-degree program and also um, things like webinars that we've already mentioned. And yes, you mentioned David Miller. David 
just returned from Kenya. He was in Kenya during December teaching at the Mennonite Anabaptist Theological College in Migori, which grew out of a conversation that Dave and I and Patrick Obonde, a recent AMBS grad, had were having about increasing Anabaptist theological education possibilities for, for Kenya and East Africa. And, and Patrick's on too. Patrick's on Welcome too. Patrick. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so Dave finally, um, David Miller was finally able to go at the end of last year and teach um, themes in the journey curriculum, not the, the full journey curriculum, but um, kind of giving an entree into AMBS education. Um, and that college has their own curriculum as well, but they're interested in AMBS partnering with them. So this was kind of an exploratory visit and a chance to do some teaching and relationship building. And it was much appreciated by David and by his, and by Zedekiah Olunga, who wrote to us to say how, what a great time they had together. Um, so that's one. Another one that I'll just quickly mention is that building on kind of the, the webinar template. Uh, right after Thanksgiving, we did a webinar for church leaders in India uh, that we planned with the Mennonite Christian Service and Fellowship of India, which is the umbrella body for Mennonites in India. Um, they requested a webinar on baptism. So we had two days, baptism, biblical and um, historical theological perspectives, again, with input from AMBS professors and um, Indian leaders responding uh, to the presentations in this case, and then open time for Q&A. And again, that initiative was also brought to us by uh, AMBS alums or current students, Elizabeth Kunjam and Pratik Bhag. So Alumni, again, are a big uh, part of driving or igniting what we're doing. <laughs> Another one we might mention, Joe, that, that is also a connection in connection to one of our alums is David Miller's teaching of the journey program in Thailand for mm -hmm. leader, Hmong leaders in Laos and Vietnam and working alongside Jonah Yang, one of our graduates. Um, it's also a very successful experience. Excellent. Yes, and I heard that David even has a baby named after him now. It's very cool. One of the participants in his most recent class teaching. Um, okay, we have a question that has come in from uh, Benjamin Isaac Krauss, who says, it sounds like technology is a big obstacle. And he understood that to be true in his time at AMBS as well. Have you... Um, thought about fundraising specifically to give students adequate devices so that they are able to um, do what they need. Who would like to answer that? Thanks, Benny, for that question. Um, I don't know, Henrik, if you want to take a stab at it or I, I can, uh, what do you prefer? I mean, I, I, I like this idea of fundraising. Like, I, I can't wait to see a lot of computer going to, you know, to our student and the student having that, you know, access. Um, but this, this another, you know, the, another thing that makes me humble and uh, likes I'm envious much is, you know, there's this discussion, I think maybe Joe and David might say a little bit more that what, what, what does that mean if we send a computer? What, what kind of, what, what makes us? You know, and I was like, you know, for me, like, I don't care. I just want the student to have access to it. I just want the student to have a really working computer with them and so that they can access the, 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 the resource that we're providing on the module side. But still, there's this ongoing discussion, you know, at the MBS that, okay, you know, to try to make sure that we are not giving some kind of signal you know, that we are, you know, we have all this resource among us, you know, so that we can just channel it on that. But like still, there are times I was even thinking like, you know what, I, I can do it by myself. I can just send a letter to people that I know 
and you know fundraise the money and send the computer to to Ethiopians, uh, especially the students who are working you know day in day out every day. And some of the questions that comes from students and why they are you know sometimes they get behind and da da is because of the computer problem. And um, so I, <laughs> I was like I really appreciate this question. And if you have any idea, please reach out to me by email. I like this um, question very much. Technology is a huge question for us, and we're constantly uh, working on what it means to purpose, to work in these contexts and have adequate technology resources. I think I think it, that's something you're getting at, Henek, um, is and part of our conversation is how do we work at providing equipment in a way that has equity to it? So some students can afford computers, some can't. Uh, we start providing computers to some and not others, what happens then? On the other hand, we also, be, as we, especially as we're doing in-person teaching, we're finding out that we have students who we've said, you need a computer to do this program. And we find out that they're actually doing their courses on large cell phones or e-readers, and they aren't, they aren't able to have a computer. Uh, another issue is what do we do about places where, uh, like we've been exploring uh, the MATCA program for Ghana, and we have big questions about whether the country's infrastructure can even support the program. And you know, we cert no amount of fundraising on our end is going to be able to solve that problem if the country's infrastructure isn't there. On the other hand, what I learned in Ethiopia, and we we came up with a pretty significant um, adaptation is that while electricity goes down, therefore internet goes down, cellular service is much more constant. And so we found that we could buy uh, cellular-based hotspots with um, fairly affordable data plans, and that when the electricity goes off, as long as the computer battery is charged, uh, you can stay connected to a hotspot and keep, keep on motoring on with your, with your coursework and engagement online. So that would that seemed like a really significant discovery, um, and I think we could do more um, more to proliferate um, hotspots for people where internet connectivity is is uh, inconsistent and electricity goes out. So we are we are constantly working on this. I mean, another question that that our IT department really you know rightfully raises is when we start sending computers overseas, who services that computer? And in some cases, there will be an adequate IT support in the context. In other cases, there wouldn't be. And if all of that IT support comes back to AMBS, that, that can be a really significant load on, on our IT capacity here. So we're very much in a process of learning and evolving. I think we're doing better and we're making discoveries, but there's some questions we have not answered yet or gotten good answers for yet. Okay, we have two more questions that have come in, and then we'll have to end uh, our time today. But now Serato says, I see that only men have been sent abroad um, to teach or to represent AMBS. And is that due to cultural matters? And just wondering if, if other cultures prefer to have male teachers or not? Um, I think that's a great question, now, and thank you. Well, that's we did great. actually send a uh, female instructor to Indonesia to the um, GITJ. Uh, that's the oldest Mennonite synod in Indonesia to their Bible college slim seminary. Jacqueline Hoover, who's a core adjunct faculty member at AMBS, went for a two week period at the end of October to teach on Islamology, which is her expertise and Christian Muslim relations. And um, she taught those two courses in their the school's curriculum, and then did a public lecture that was attended by more than 200 leaders, men and women, on women preaching the gospel, a Mennonite perspective. And we had a Zoom follow-up call the other week with the leaders of the seminary and um, women leaders who were a part of that experience. And it was obvious that they found it so inspiring to see um, Jacqueline her passion and her expertise, um, they took a lot of encouragement from, from her presence with them. So I didn't get a chance to mention that, but that was on my list. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah. That's great to know. We, we um, will certainly send female teachers. Uh, it's, it's only been based on content uh, 
uh, relative to the program, why it's been only men. Um, and certainly at Meserie de Cristo Seminary, there are female uh, professors and lecturers there. Uh, so this would not be an issue in, in that program at or Korea for sure. And I'd like us to close with a, a wonderful question from Randy Detweiler. He asks, what are we learning that will encourage or strengthen the church in our North American context? Thank you, Randy, for that question. I feel like I've done a lot of talking, Joe or Hannah, do you want to go first? And I have some things I could say, but. <laughs> well, I, this comes more out of an experience I had last semester leading witness colloquium at AMBS where we're, there were uh, four students from Africa in the course, or three from Africa in the course, two from Meserede Christos um, Church. And we students did presentations on what a peace witness looks like in their context. And I was struck again by how central uh, evangelism is in their understanding of what leads to peace. Um, so that sense of one's personal connection to, to God as being a source of peace that sustains you in the work of peace between humans or between nations or between communities. So um, that kind of, that emphasis there on evangelism and on like the, the vertical connection to God being important in the work also of the horizontal dimension, I think is something that the global church helps to magnify for us in North America. I think this is, I feel like this is the question is more of for Joe and David who stay here and knows about US culture more than I do. Uh, but what I can say is, you know, collaboration like this, you know, you, you are continuously engaged with uh, people around the world and there's that exposure, that relationship, ongoing relationship you know, gives you an opportunity for this gift sharing, you know, sharing, you know, what works there, what works here. So in a way that it changes you, uh, it changes your perspective or the way you see things. Um, um, so I, I like there's um, in Ethiopia, there's this saying that you don't go just for a business. You have to have like all kind of uh, meal, you know, all, you need to have that built up, the relationship built up before you do the business. You can't just dump on the business and do the, let's do this thing kind of thing. So I think that's what I, I see here in this collaboration, seeing, you know, people over here with, you know, the, you know, the local leaders back home in Ethiopia, Indonesia, South Korea, being friend, you know, continuously engaging with questions and, you know, continue having this interaction kind of helps you, you know, uh, to share and to see, you know, uh, how things work here, how things work that, and through that process kind of changed you. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, I've seen that a lot. Uh, that's only, I think I can say, but that relationship, you know, continues being engaging in the you know, conversation kind of helps you um, to be, you know, stable continuously and have some kind of perspective on things. I think you're absolutely right, Hannah. Nobody, nobody participating in this program leaves it the same. It is transformational. Um, I also think that we're not just doing academic institution at to academic institution work. We are doing it with the church. And that is keeping us, that is keeping our work in education really grounded in the church in the global context. It's very clear to us when we're in these uh, doing this kind of program. AMBS may have a very long, uh, deep tradition of theological education, but the center of Anabaptist identity is no longer in the West. Um, and there is a great deal that we need to learn about what effective Anabaptist leadership means in other contexts and how we can think about uh, the blind spots we have in North America um, around what might lead us to greater levels of faithfulness and effectiveness in Anabaptist leadership. Um, 
I, I also um, think that it, we, we want to make sure that um, in, in our work, we're trying to represent a majority report on what it means to be uh, Anabaptist and carry out that witness in the world. So um, I think there's just countless ways that this engagement is energizing. We, we certainly don't want to be opportunistic about this, like you know, using our opportunity to be in other countries to make Mennonite Church USA or Mennonite Church Canada stronger. <laughs> um, but it certainly has a transformational effect. It also highlights for us that the, the issues that we find most challenging in our church context that those issues become relativized when we realize what the significant issues are that other churches are facing. For example, in Ethiopia, when we're engaging students who are asking questions about, can, is peace witness realistic in a context of civil war where my family is living, facing danger? Uh, that says something to us about our questions that we think are breaking up our church or, or, or challenging us most because, um, it isn't just one question, it's many questions that are challenging the church and what it means to be faithful uh, uh, really broadens as we're engaged in the, in the global church in this way. Well, thanks to each of you, Dave, Joe, Hanak, for answering all these questions and giving us a glimpse into all of the wonderful things that are happening around the world. I want to thank also our alumni for your ongoing support of AMBS. We really appreciate your financial support, your prayers, and the prospective students you encourage to consider studies at AMBS. Let us know if we can help you do any of those things. Next month, we will not have a third Thursday conversation because it falls during our pastors and leaders event. So we um, invite you to join that event. If you haven't already signed up, there's still a little bit of time to do that. And um, ask you to join us again March 16th when I talk to Melinda Berry, Associate Professor of Theology and Ethics. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. And thanks also to student Janet McGeary, who provided technical support for this webinar. This concludes today's third Thursday's conversation. Have a great day.